So two weeks ago, I rewatched The Northman on VOD, and this movie is spectacular. For me, this just solidifies the director's place as my favorite new filmmaker. He's clearly on the level of the greats with just three films on his resume, and I can't wait to discuss all of these mythological symbols and references, and most importantly, my interpretation of the film's thematic message. So to break this movie down, we're gonna use two themes. One, prophecy of vengeance. We'll discuss the film's central meaning, the opening monologue, the ravens, Odin, the father-son ritual with the burping and farting, an amless lineage, and two, virus of evil. We'll discuss the Cirrus Witch, the Draugr Sword, Queen Gudrun's true backstory, Amless Children, the Legend of Amless story that this movie is based on, and the woman on the horse riding into the sky at the end of the film, and much more. And if you like this video, please leave a thumbs up and a comment, it helps so much. And if you want to see more of these, please make sure to subscribe as well. Let's get started. Theme number one, Prophecy of Vengeance. Between The Witch, The Lighthouse, and The Northman, this movie is most certainly Robert Eggers' most straightforward film, narratively and thematically. But obviously, since it's Robert Eggers, there are still countless mythological symbols, references, and sub-themes that can make this movie a little confusing. So just like my Witch and Lighthouse videos, I want to clarify what I believe the central thematic meaning of The Northman is. So to me, the main idea that The Northman is trying to capture is this. The cost of one's devotion to their believed fate and their surrender to the viral nature of evil. And the topic of fate is the very most prominent in this movie, as it's immediately established in the very first shot of the film. The film opens with the following monologue. Hear me, Odin, all father of the gods. Summon the shadows of ages past, where the threads spinning norns ruled the fates of men. Here of a prince's vengeance quenched at the fiery gates of hell, a prince destined for Valhall. Hear me. This opening statement is a message to Odin from the Hewitch and a prophecy about the destiny of our main character, Amleth. And I just want to break down this opening statement, since a lot of what is mentioned here is touched on continuously throughout the movie. The he witch who is saying this is this man, who we see midway through the movie, who plays a big part in the spiritual path of Amleth's destiny. Odin is known as the all-father of gods in Norse religion, who is worshipped by Norse warriors. The Norns are known to be the three goddesses in Norse mythology, representing past, present, and future. These three wise women spun thread to determine every allotted lifespan in the mortal world. One spun out the thread of each human life, another measured its length, and the third decided where the thread should be cut. The fiery gates of hell is this location where Amleth's destiny is to be fulfilled, and Valhall is the golden fortress known as Odin's Hall, where all warriors would go if they died in honor. To put it simply, Valhall is Viking and warrior heaven. So in regular terms, this opening statement from the Hewitch is a prophecy for Amleth to fulfill his destiny by avenging his father and killing his uncle Fjolnir at this volcano location and ascending into Odin's Valhall after he dies in honor. Next, we see two ravens fly from this volcano across the water towards Amleth's father's kingdom. These ravens are Odin's two ravens named Hugin and Munin. The two ravens in Norse mythology kept Odin informed on everything that was going on in the mortal world. Amleth's father, King Orvindil, of course worships Odin and is known to be the war raven and raven king. This could in some way indicate King Orvindil's heightened connection to Odin and his ability to communicate with him in some way. And I feel like the ravens visiting Arvindil's kingdom right after hearing the Hewitch's prophecy is the reason why Arvindil is suddenly compelled to pass on his destiny of vengeance to his son in the next scene. It's as if Odin sent his ravens to King Arvindil to communicate the prophetic words that he heard from the Hewitch. So of course, in the following scene, we begin a ritual with King Arvindil and his son Amleth. This ritual takes place in this underground sacred location where Odin is worshipped and prayed to, and Hymir is officiating this sacred ceremony. Hymir's monologue during the ceremony very closely reflects the opening monologue from the He-Witch at the beginning of the movie, where he announces Amleth's fate to avenge his father once his father is killed in battle. Amleth and Arvindil demonstrate the most primitive and uncivilized behaviors as they crawl, growl, burp, and fart, becoming animals of the wild, 
specifically wolves. Wolves are heavily respected in Nordic culture and are known to be the ancestors of strong Norse warriors. Odin's two wolves are the symbol of his ability to destroy. Therefore, they are a very large part of the rituals of kings and princes, as well as berserker vikings, as we see later in the movie. From Hymir, we hear about the three Norn goddesses once again, and their will of fate using the thread that determines every person's future. We also hear about the Valkyries' embrace, which is super important for probably the most mysterious sequence in the entire movie. Hymir is referring to the Valkyries in Old Norse religion and Norse mythology. The Valkyries were servants of Odin who scouted the mortal world for honorable warriors who have been killed in battle. When these Valkyries find dead, honorable warriors, they pick them up and carry them on horseback to the gates of Valhall, which was mentioned before in the opening monologue. To put it very simply, the Valkyries carry dead, honorable warriors to Odin's warrior heaven, and we'll touch back on this later in the film. Heimer describes drinking the mead of knowledge, which I think relates to the mead of poetry in Norse mythology, which is a mythical beverage that gives you knowledge beyond regular human capability. And I think this is why, after Amleth drinks that sort of brew in the bowl, he is able to see his family tree when touching his father's wound. And of course, through this visual, he knows he is next in line to be king after his father dies in battle. And when his father is killed and his mother is kidnapped by his uncle Fjolnir, he escapes repeating the phrase, I will avenge you father, I will save you mother, I will kill you Fjolnir. His journey towards his destiny has officially begun. Theme number two, virus of evil. During Amleth's time as a relentless berserker viking, he encounters a Cirrus. A Cirrus is a Nordic witch who practices magic connected to the gods. The Cirrus reminds Amleth of the fate that the Norn goddesses have spun for him, and reminds him of the importance of destiny. She also hands him his last teardrop that Hymir collected during the ceremony in Arvindil's kingdom. But what I found most fascinating about the Cirrus' monologue was that she says, For where your path of ashes ends, another will begin her journey, a maiden king. This ties in heavily with the end of the film for me, and I'll surely get into why I think this later in this video. When Amleth finally makes it to Fjolnir's village after enslaving himself, he is led by a mysterious cub to the Hewitch, and the Hewitch communicates through Hymir, who Fjolnir has now killed, that he must acquire the sword Draugr to kill Fjolnir. It is owned by the Mound Dweller. The sword relates to the mythology of Draugr, which is known to be an undead creature living in their grave underground, guarding some kind of sacred treasure. In this case, of course, the treasure is the sacred sword itself. And it's a really cool sequence here where Amleth fights the Mound Dweller and defeats him, yet seconds later, the Mound Dweller remains sitting in its seat where Amleth just removes the sword from its grasp and it collapses. And for me, this sequence has some thematic significance around Amleth's death destiny versus his free will, which I will return to later in this video. Later on in the film, when Amleth reveals his true identity to his mother, Queen Gudrun, in an attempt to save her, she reveals an even bigger surprise to him. Gudrun claims that her true love is actually Amleth's uncle, Fjolnir, and she and Fjolnir together planned to have Amleth's father killed. She claims she was initially captured and made a slave by King Arvindil, and Amleth is, therefore, a bastard son. And this reveal was actually hinted at when Hymir cracked a joke about Queen Gudrun's infidelity and unreliability. Look how the queen's cup grows wet for more men than her king. What metal may buy a fragrant sip? Sweet silver or hard iron? Even though Hymer the Jester is full of dirty jokes, he is certainly more knowledgeable than one may think, since he can also officiate a ceremony to determine a prince's destiny. And Hymer's joke makes even more sense in the next moment of the scene. When Gudrun senses disbelief from Amleth, she attempts to engage romantically with her own son in a final effort of alliance. There's no complete certainty on the truth of Gudrun's intentions, but it's very clear to me that Queen Gudrun has always been desperately scrambling to ensure her own safety, latching on to whoever can save her in the current moment because she knows what it's like to live without any safety, security, or family whatsoever. And Hymir's raunchy prophetic joke seems to confirm that. Also, when Gudrun dies later in the movie, she says thank you 
for putting an end to the desperate mess she has forever been living through. So throughout the second act of the movie, Amleth and the very clever Olga are able to work together with hallucinatory mushroom concoctions and brute strength to make Fjolnir's life miserable. And since they've fallen in love, the two of them actually decide to escape before Fjolnir is killed. However, once Amleth touches Olga's wound, because he drank the meat of knowledge in the first ceremony, he sees his lineage through Olga with a boy and a girl who will succeed him. Once again, Amleth is sucked back into his destiny of vengeance, and he abandons Olga to kill Fjolnir. And his reasoning for this decision is he wants to ensure his children's survival by making sure that Fjolnir is no longer alive. And it's these drastic decisions from Amleth that make me think the film is proposing a major question. Is your destiny greater than you, or is it simply a desire created and growing within your own free will? And so many of these supernatural elements in the film are portrayed in such a grounded way that they border the territory of just being within our main character's imagination and not actually being real. For example, Amleth battles the Mound Dweller, but in the next moment, it appears sitting in the same seat and collapses when the sword is removed, meaning that battle may not have happened. And the moment with the Cirrus happens in the middle of the night and she disappears out of thin air, meaning it could possibly be a dream that stems from desire. I'm not saying it's all fake. So much of the prophecies align so perfectly that I would certainly say all of the supernatural elements are real in this movie, but I feel like many of the scenes propose the idea that some of these prophetic moments could be within the heads of our characters, which introduces the idea that Amleth's fate of vengeance may be escapable. And to add to this point, the He Witch says, you must choose between kindness for your kin or hate your enemies. It's as if a choice has always truly been there for Amleth. And I think this all ties in very tightly with the idea of the viral spread of evil. The necklace that Amleth is given was taken from a prince after that prince was killed by Amleth's father. This gift is the initiation of Amleth's destiny of vengeance. And when Amleth's father is killed, Amleth must kill the killer of his father. And when Amleth eventually dies in battle, the cycle of vengeance continues. The Cirrus even said, as I mentioned earlier in this video, that a maiden king would begin her journey once Amleth's path of ashes ends. Later in the film, we see a close-up on his daughter as the maiden king, who is wearing the same necklace of vengeance that Arvindale gave to Amleth and Amleth gave to Olga before he set out for revenge. This movie is also based on the Old North legend of Amleth, which famously inspired Shakespeare's Hamlet and even Disney's The Lion King. And just like all of these stories, in that original story, a son named Amleth kills his jealous uncle to avenge his father. He uses clever scheming to have his vengeance and is successful, but eventually, when everything seemed to be over and peaceful, Amleth was killed by a character who at first seemed insignificant. And one of the most important lines in that original story of Amleth is, the first iniquity is incentive for the second, which essentially means one act of immorality will give reason for another act of immorality by someone else. And the virus of immorality and revenge spreads like wildfire. And when I look at this film, the same thing is happening. Countless characters are dragged into this mess of lies, secrets, violence, and death. And this mess only continues to grow until everyone is dead. And all of this is captured with Fjolnir's very powerful line in the movie, evil begets evil, which means evil gives rise to new evil. So even if Amleth ultimately has a choice, the desire for revenge will always be so much more powerful than the desire for forgiveness or withdrawal. So in the end of the film, as we all see, Fjolnir's family is killed and Fjolnir and Amleth kill each other at the same time. And as the prophecy promised, the Valkyrie rides into the gates of Valhall to carry Amleth to his destined salvation. But will this destined ending establish peace for Amleth's offspring and end the cycle of vengeance since Fjolnir and his entire family are all dead? Or is it also fate that Amleth's loving son and daughter will fall victim in some unforeseen way to the unforgiving, deadly virus of evil? 
All right, this is my analysis. Subscribe for the videos and please send me recommendations. Now, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the movie because it really is spectacular. It's one of my favorites of the year. I hope to see you again and thank you so much for watching. See you later.